Uh, now let me introduce our, our speaker, uh, Professor Lee M. Silver, who comes to us from Princeton University, uh, which you may recall is the place from which Professor Bachner came to Rice. And at Princeton, Silver uh, holds joint appointments. He's a professor both in the Department of Molecular Biology and in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And I don't think I need to remind most of you that the first president of Rice University, Edgar O'Dell Lovett, came to us not only from Princeton, but on the recommendation of Woodrow Wilson, who was then the president of Princeton University, and of course, after whom the Woodrow Wilson School is named. By way of formalities, let me say that Dr. Silver graduated in 1973 with a BA, uh, magna cum laude, from University of Pennsylvania. And in 1973, he received an MS in physics, also from that same institution, and then went on in 1978 to receive his PhD from Harvard in biophysics. Following then, he held positions uh, up through associate professor at Sloan Kettering and then joined Cold Spring Harbor uh, and, and the faculty at uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook until uh, he moved in 1984 to the uh, biology department uh, at Princeton University. And there he quickly and I think appropriately enough forged links with a number of other institutions and departments at Princeton, including ecology and evolutionary biology, neuroscience, and others, including obviously the Woodrow Wilson School, where he now holds professorial rank both there and in molecular biology. He's the author of the very influential 1997 book called Remaking Eden, uh, How Genetic Engineering and Cloning Will Transform the American Family, which is now published in 15 languages and perhaps Dr. Silver will tell us what those 15 languages are and what people who don't speak any of those 15 uh, can do to learn about what's in his book. He's authored an undergraduate textbook in genetics and a textbook on, uh, for professionals on uh, mouse genetics. In 1993, he was elected a fellow of the AAAS, and in 1995, he received an unsolicited 10-year National Institute of Health Merit Award. He's published over 180 scientific articles in the fields of genetics, evolution, reproduction, embryology, computational modeling, and behavioral science, among um, papers and just a whole slew of other topics. He's been members, he's, he's been elected to the governing board of the Genomic Society of America and the International Mammalian Society of, uh, of, uh, um, of Mammalian Genome Society. He's been a, a consultant to the New Jersey State Legislature, but has also uh, been uh, helpful with the U.S. Congress and the New York State uh, Senate subcommittees on matters involving the intersection of science and public policy. You've probably seen him on television. He's appeared on numerous uh, TV and radio sh shows, including the NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, Jim Lehrer's uh, PBS NewsHour, ABC Nightline, uh, World Report with Peter Jennings, 60 Minutes, and many other programs. Uh, his remarkable Remaking Eden book, which was described by David Baltimore, the Nobel laureate and president of Caltech, um, as, quote, the most important book about modern biology that I have seen recently. Uh, this book demystifies science and technology of reproduction and genetics and describes incredible new ways in which people will be able to reproduce and choose the genes that they provide to their children. The book also considers the fundamental ethical dilemmas that arise from competing principles of individual autonomy and social justice, explaining how and why the marketplace and human nature may uniquely determine the use of these technologies. So we are fortunate indeed to have with us tonight Professor Silver to speak to us. So without further ado, let me ask you as always to turn off your cell phones, pagers, or anything else that beeps or makes noises, and to tune in to Professor Silver, whose title is Biotechnology and the Reconstruction of the Soul. Professor Silver. That would be great. A moment for technology. much, Tim, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you very much to, uh, to Rice University for inviting me here tonight. I'm very pleased to, uh, to be here. I've had a wonderful day talking to a variety of faculty members who, as always, forced me to reconsider the ideas that uh, uh, I've had. Um, I'm going to, uh, 
uh, reveal something to you right now, which is that when I wrote my first popular book in 1997, um, I, was, I was just in the Department of Molecular Biology at that time, and I, and uh, having had an undergraduate degree, undergraduate degree in physics makes you very arrogant. You think you understand everything in the world. Um, and over the last seven years, I realized how naive and ignorant I was, and I'm still learning that. And that's sort of um, what I like to do, as, as you probably heard from Jim, is I like to hop around from one thing to another, because I really feel there's so much to learn. You don't want to spend too much time doing one thing, otherwise you won't learn other kinds of things. And so what I'm doing now is writing um, two-thirds of my way through another book with this title. Um, I've learned an enormous amount since I wrote my last book. I'm really sometimes embarrassed by the naivete I expressed in my last book. And I hope this is the first time I'm going to give you this, uh, actually the first time I'm going to present a lecture of this kind tonight. And so I hope that if anybody has comments or um, uh, can help me figure this out, I'd appreciate it after, uh, after I speak. Okay, so biotechnology and the reconstruction of the soul. The soul is not something that, um, uh, secular academics talk about very much. In fact, it's not even something that spouses talk about if they're not religious. And I'm uh, uh, fascinated to find out about five or six years ago that none, I didn't understand, know what any of my friends actually thought about this topic since I'm in a secular academic circle. I didn't even know what my wife of 20 years thought about this topic. So I think this is a, a fascinating issue and I think it impacts very much um, on the, on the future of biotechnology and whether people accept or reject biotechnology. Biotechnology, like any powerful technology, can be used for good purposes and bad purposes. Um, but the, at the moment, there is a huge conflict, and I'm gonna talk about that tonight. Now, since um, my, my book actually looks at both human-affecting technologies as well as plants and animal-affecting technologies, but since the theme of this uh, lecture series is human, I'm gonna focus mostly on humans tonight and do a little bit about animals and plants. So what, um, the, the first question, before I get to the soul, I'm gonna sort of lead up there. Um, I'm going to talk about human beings. Why, um, what is a human being? And why does it matter what a human being is? Uh, when it comes to human affecting technologies, there's a whole series of new biotechnologies that are uh, affect human beings and are, are very much, uh, uh, the way people think about them is very much affected by the way they view human beings. This is not a topic that research scientists had to worry about 20 or 30 years ago because in the laboratory you didn't work with, with um, you worked maybe with human cells, but you didn't work with anything that could conceivably be called a human being. But now, because of the new technology, we're forced to ask, scientists are forced to ask these questions and to deal with uh, public opinions about the uh, answers to these um, to these questions. So, should he human embryos be used for research and therapy? Um, these are just some of the questions I'm going to deal with tonight. Should scientists be allowed to grow animals with human organs? All these things are going to be possibilities um, soon. Should people be allowed to enhance themselves? Uh, by that I mean, especially genetic enhancement. Uh, should people be allowed to alter their children's dream genes to avoid disease? And should people be allowed to enhance their children's genes to give them better than average traits? Uh, the, all of these are contentious questions. And um, they're, they're, as I'll sh point out through this uh, lecture, a lot of the contention has to do with people's notions of soul. But before I get ahead of myself, let's start at the beginning. Uh, what criteria can be used to distinguish human beings from other living organisms. So I want to talk first, I'm just going to talk about human beings. What is a human being? How do we distinguish human beings from other living organisms? Okay, here's a picture of my son and a chimpanzee in Bangkok. Uh, they actually look very similar to each other, as you can see. <laughs> Same eyes. Um, so what is it? And I, I've put four different living things here on this slide. So my son, a chimpanzee, this is a uh, one cell human embryo, and these are embryonic stem cells over here. Now, according to biologists, these are all alive, okay? These three are human. Uh, they have the same, almost the same genome, presumably. Uh, and the question is, that how do we distinguish all these things from each other? How, how do we decide what is a human being and what is not a human being? Um, so these are some of the criteria that you might use. Alive with human genes, so that would include this, this and this, but not, we would think not that, but I'll show you, I think that's actually a fallacious 
uh, point of view in a moment, the potential to become a human being. So you would think, okay, well, it's this and this who has reached the potential, not embryonic stem cells and not chimps. The presence of a human mind that was only be here. Human appearance, that's only here. Human parents. Well, these cells actually have human parents, um, as, do, as does this cell and as does my son. Um, and the last question is a human soul. So which one of these, which of these criteria or combination of these criteria is most important? And do these criteria make any sense? And that's the first question that I'm going to ask. I should tell you tonight that I'm going to ask a lot of questions and not give very many answers. And uh, what I'd like to do, and I, I think my role in all of this is that this is basically poke holes in other people's conceptions without giving them <laughs> the uh, understanding of what the real truth might be, because I don't know the truth. Um, this is a comparison of chimp and human DNA. It's a gene that I used to work with in my, in my laboratory, which is why I like it. And, and uh, it's very typical, very typical of the difference between human and, and chimps. This is, uh, if you, I'm not going to go into basic molecular biology, but I'm sure you all know that DNA is coded with a digital code, and there are four different values that each bit of this digital code can have, A, G, C, and T. And what you're looking at here is, uh, I think it's about 1,900 bases, and each of the yellow ones is where chimp and human differ from each other. Now, that's remarkable. That is, uh, I think that when, when DNA sequencing first became possible in the 1970s, people were shocked uh, about, uh, by how similar chimp and human DNA are. 99%, uh, there's 99% similarity between chimp uh, and human, and all of these differences that I show you here actually have no, they're actually meaningless differences. None of them change the, the structure of the, of the product of this particular gene. So there are very, very few differences between chimps and humans. And the most important thing is that there isn't really anything that you can call a human gene. Many of our genes are actually shared um, identically with chimpanzees, and in fact, some of our genes are shared to a great extent with mice. 90% of our genes are actually shared to a great extent with mice. And so the difference between chimp and humans is not in the genes, it's really in these little teeny bits of information which may or may not be sig significant. So that's the first point I, I want to make. Um, so is alive with human genes relevant? Well, here are embryonic stem cells, which nobody in this country seems to think um, are human beings. This is alive with human genes, um, and uh, we don't think it's a human being. And this animal over here is, is essentially, it's 99% human, right? And we don't consider it a human being. So it's very difficult to use the concepts, uh, the concept of human genes as a, as, a, as a means for distinguishing human beings. What about the potential to become a human being? How do we deal with that? Well, this has the potential, in theory, to become a human being. Uh, nothing along the developmental lines of chimpanzee had this potential. So how do we deal with potential? So it's a little, it's important to go back over the um, uh, beginning of human reproduction. This is all possible to do in the laboratory, it's done all over the place now for in vitro fertilization. This is a one cell human embryo to, what happens is the embryo divides for uh, about seven days without changing in size. Uh, this is when the embryo is sort of floating freely in the reproductive system um, of, the, of the woman. It doesn't have any, it doesn't actually have any energy resources. So it, so it divides and divides and divides. This is the same size as the one cell. And the most amazing thing of all, since I worked with mouse embryos for uh, most of my career, is that um, unless you are embryologists in this room, nobody in this room will be able to tell the difference between a human embryo at this stage and a mouse embryo. Same size, look almost identical. I mean, there are some subtle differences, but uh, you know, the same size little embryos, one becomes a mouse, one becomes a human being um, because of the, of, the, of the genes inside of these, uh, of these cells. This all happens before the... Uh, before the embryo implants and takes over the woman's body like an alien creature. Uh, if anybody's been pregnant, they don't understand what that's all about. Um, so um, what is the um, significance of potential? Here's an eight-cell embryo. It, it divides, it becomes this 64-cell embryo. And there's a bunch of cells here, and there's just some cells around on the outside. Now, one thing that's actually quite amazing is that at this stage, only three of these cells 
Actually, that's a picture of my daughter a long time ago. Um, only three cells give rise to the fetus and the baby. What do the other 61 cells do? Uh, the other 61 cells go into the placenta and extra embryonic tissue. Now, uh, ahead of time, you don't know which of these cells, so some of these cells, you see, are gonna end up here. All of, the, all of the daughter cells from some of these cells end up here. You don't know at this point which of these cells is gonna be the lucky, gonna end up as the lucky three which produce the entire um, fetus and, and child. So that's pretty interesting. And what do we do about these cells over here? Well, I'm gonna show you a couple of shocking slides actually throughout this talk. Uh, this is the first shocking slide. How do you deal with these human cells which have developed and they've, they've ended up in the placenta uh, well, this is how they're dealt with sometimes. This is a uh, shampoo, and uh, placentas get sold because they're, they're big, you know, and they've got a lot of protein, and they, they don't serve any other purpose. And you notice the ingredients over here, human placental protein. So that's, that's what we, that's the kind of respect we give to these uh, derivatives of, of, of human embryos. It's interesting that they don't even say it's golden, what are they called, uh, contains natural plant extracts, which I can't find here, but it, 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 contains, it contains extracts from what used to be a human embryo. Um, so, uh, so the next time you shampoo your hair, you realize you're putting human embryo protein into your hair. Um, this is a four cell human embryo, and I've taken off uh, with the computer, not, uh, not in reality, the coating that usually holds the four cells together. It's called the zona pellucida, and uh, what, um, what uh, in vitro fertilization clinics can do right now is they can actually, th th this is really, th there are many things that I, all, that I actually taught once were impossible that are now routine, and one of these is that you can take a cell from a four cell embryo like that, you can stick it into a test tube and you can read the DNA that's in that cell to find out whether or not this embryo um, is going to be carrying a particular disease, mutation, um, or any other kind of gene, really. The, the technology in the 1980s was invented to do that. And so you take one cell off, you stick it into the test tube, the other three cells, um, you can get a baby coming out, okay? Everybody says, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, there's a problem here if you, if you think that potential is important. And the problem, uh, so you, end, you, know, you start with a one embryo, you end up with one baby. The problem is that this four cell embryo, once you take off uh, the cell which you're removing for a diagnosis, that cell, so now the potential actually exists for two babies because this cell can become a baby. And uh, this is an example you'll see in a moment. These are two out of a pair of identical quadruplets. Uh, you broke this embryo apart. You now have the potential for two human beings. Okay, so the uh, start with the potential for one baby, you end up with two babies over here. Um, you can also start with an embryo, four cells. You can break it apart. This is my, I tell my students, so let's say a woman decides that uh, she only wants to be pregnant once, but she wants two kids, and so she tells the doctor to take the embryo and break it apart so that she can have twins. And uh, then she says, oh, I changed my mind. So the doctor says, well, I don't want to kill anything, so I'm just going to put it back together again. And so you're going to take these four cells, you have double potential here, um, and then you put it back together again. Everything I'm telling you is possible. This is not just, and this is what would happen, all of this has been done with mouse embryos, and one of the things we've learned is that if you can do it with mice, we've discovered, you can figure out how to do it with human beings. Um, so you start with one embryo in a dish, you have two embryos here, and then you end up with one embryo. So you end up where you started. So did you, um, did you destroy anything along this process? My colleague and frequent debater, Robert George, who was a member of the Leon Cass Bioethics Commission, uh, when I give him this example as, as, as problematic for using potential um, for uh, this, this defining a human being, says, well, here you have created a second human being, and uh, what happens here, this is his quote, one twin dies and his cells become part of the other twin. So that's, what, that's his interpretation of this, um, th what's happening here. Um, the, the problem is that nothing, nothing's dying. Um, there's three, there are four cells here, there are four cells here. You haven't killed any cells. Um, um, so it's, 
not clear what is, is dying in this process. So what's the potential? Let's go back to a four cell embryo. A four cell embryo, if you look at its maximum potential, this is a very rare event, but it does occur. These are actually identical quadruplets. And after every lecture that I show this slide into my students, somebody raises my raises his hand and said, how come two of them are male and two are female? I think that's just because they, you know, they ran out of blue or pink uh, pajamas. Um, they're all for the same sex. And uh, they come out of a single embryo. Okay, so a four cell embryo is the potential to give four human beings. Um, now these children were created, well the embryo was uh, divided, um, it happened spontaneously several days after fertilization was completed. Um, so the question now was where was the potential for all four babies present here, or did the potential arise after the embryo broke apart a few days later? And you can also ask the question, well, this happened naturally, right? What, what if you uh, did this um, in the laboratory? So in other words, you can take a four cell embryo. I've actually done this with my own hands with, with mice. And you can take it, you can break it apart, you get four baby mice, right? And so is the potential present in a one cell embryo, even when the extra embryos were created by technicians in, in the laboratory? It's just showing you the problems with talking about potential. Um, every viable pre-implantation embryo has the potential to form many, many babies. Now, it goes even beyond that. Uh, the other thing that can happen, this actually happens sometimes in human beings as well, you, two embryos uh, at an early stage like this, um, which are completely separate, they're different eggs and sperm that came together, you have two embryos, uh, sometimes they stick to each other, okay? And we actually make this happen in the laboratory with mice. Uh, and these are some of the favorite mice that I've created. So these mice actually have four parents. And the way we created these mice was by taking an embryo from two albino parents. You can see the white color here. And then we had an embryo from parents that are called a goody, which is like this dark color. And then you can put them together. The cells themselves don't hybridize. So, uh, uh, what's happening is you just have a mixture of cells. You can see which cells came from that embryo. Which, uh, which cells came from the other embryo. This is called a chimera. It's actually very easy to do in the laboratory. And sometimes it happens naturally with human beings. And the only reason that uh, people find out about that, there are six billion people on Earth, which, is, which means that you know, even if something has like one in a hundred million chance of occurring, it's occurred on Earth. Um, so what happens sometimes is that when a woman ovulates two eggs and they both get fertilized, if they both implanted, you get fraternal twins. But if the two embryos implant right next to each other, they'll grow into each other and give you a single uh, child. And if one happens to be male and the other happens to be female, uh, then you end up with a person who could be intersex, which means they have what doctors call ambiguous genitalia. And uh, you go and you look at these people and then you discover that they've got two different kinds of cells inside of them. So the point of all of this, um, so here again, potential for life is eliminated without anything dying. Um, uh, what cells have the potential to develop into human beings? So you see how problematic potential is getting. Now before 1997, um, the scientific dogma, um, uh, what I'm learning is that biological dogma is gonna, every biological dogma that I know about has been destroyed. Um, and the dogma before 1997 was that only cells inside the earliest embryo have this potential to develop into a human being all other cells are irreversibly differentiated. In other words, the cells in your adult body, they cannot make human beings. This is what people thought until 1997. 1997 is not that long ago. Um, and, but a, lo a big thing happened in 1997, which is that the scientific dogma was shattered. Um, adult cells essentially could be um, reversed and made, em you can make embryos out of adult cells. And uh, that's, that was, everybody knows about Dolly, the cloned sheep. In theory, now this is just theory. In theory, every human cell, almost every human cell, has the potential to form a human being, which means that every time you blow your nose, you're blowing out human cells that are living human cells, um, which means you're destroying potential life by blowing your nose. Um, not, not, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to basically explain how difficult these, these concepts and how you have to talk about this. Necessary conclusion, by itself, the potential to develop into a human being cannot be the basis for moral worth because what we're seeing is, is that potential is not absolute. 
you know, poten you know, potentials. Basically, this is all probability. Some cells have a greater or lesser probability of of developing into a human being, but in theory, they all have. Uh, most of them have the potential. And I and it's very important to distinguish between technical and theoretical because if you want to talk about philosophy and ethics, it doesn't matter that you don't have the technology today if the technology might be invented in 10 years to do this. Okay, so. Um, this is, now, we're going to go a step further now, and uh, I told you about the eight cell embryo, and a few of these cells in here actually form um, the fetus and the baby, and in 1998, one year after Dolly was uh, produced, uh, scientists figured out how to take these cells, so these are the cells, these cells have the potential by themselves to develop into every tissue and organ in the body, and scientists figured out how to take those cells, which are called embryonic stem cells, and grow them in a petri dish. Now, normally what happens during development is that these cells uh, differentiate, they develop into the, into the 100 trillion cells that are in our body, whoops, and they, um, they're no longer embryonic-like. And scientists figure out how to not only take these cells and grow them, but to keep them in a Peter Pan-like embryonic state for as long as you'd like, and then uh, the basic technology of embryonic stem cell research that scientists are working on right now is trying to figure out how to convert these cells into different tissues and organs that would be uh, useful for overcoming human disease. Now, this is the killer. I'm going to tell you a secret that no scientist wants to get out, um, but I'm going to tell you. Um, Ten years ago, uh, this t embryonic stem cells were um, actually derived from mice a longer time ago. Uh, actually, back in the 1980s, they were derived from mice, and people said, oh, well, you can do it from mice, but it's never going to be possible in humans. That's what people always say. And uh, that's, it's, you know, if you can do it in mice, you can do it in humans. Um, uh, Janet Rosant, Canadian scientist, made embryonic stem cells from mice, and then she did something very interesting. So, so, the, so the first question, of course, is that, is this killing, one step, one step back, is this killing a human being? Um, some people think yes, and this is the, the uh, Leon Cass's Bioethics Commission says this, uh, turning this into this, um, is destroying the embryo. So this is the question, is this really destroying the embryo when you, when you pull these cells out and put them and grow them into a petri dish? So what Janet Rosant did 10 years ago is that, I'm not going to give you all the gory details, but I'm going to give you sort of uh, the most important concepts that she derived. She figured out how to take an empty trophoblastic coat. So the trophoblastic coat is these cells on the outside which are used, which are developed into the placenta, okay? She, she got one embryo which was sort of an empty trophoblastic coat. She took embryonic stem cells, stuck them in the middle there, and what happened is that the stuff on the outside, this is obviously, obviously a schematic diagram, stuff on the outside became the placenta, and these cells um, went into, this hasn't been done with humans, but went into a mouse. And so what this tells you is embryonic stem cells can become a whole human being. Now, it hasn't been done in humans yet, but I am quite confident that anybody wanted to do this, and I'm not saying it's ethical in any way, this is a thought experiment, um, it could be done, which says, what's going on here? If this is killing, making embryonic stem cells is killing a human being, then where would this human being come from, right? It, it, unless you think it was alive the whole time. So you can begin to see sort of the problems of, uh, of, uh, of calling different things different ways. Scientists have not revealed that these cells actually could be, could actually, can actually develop into every single tissue and organ, which is why they're such a powerful scientific tool to begin with. Um, so the potential to become a human being is very fuzzy. It's very difficult to use that as a, as a way to, to find human beings. So what about a human mind and appearance? Okay, so these things don't have a human appearance uh, because if you, you look under the microscope at these, you wouldn't know whether they were human or monkey or mouse or cow or dog. Uh, this has a human appearance and a mind, uh, and this one has a chimp appearance and a mind. My, my colleague, Peter Singer, uh, who I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree with tonight, thinks that the distinction between the two of these is not relevant. Uh, I, I don't agree with him, and we're gonna, I'm going to work through that, why I don't agree with him. But let's talk about the importance of human minds and human appearance. Um, so the pictures I'm going to show you are a little difficult to handle. Uh, they're all real. Um, this is, these are twins uh, named Abigail and Brittany Hensel. They live in, a, this is real. These, these girls were really born. This is what they look like at three months. Um, here you can see them standing over here. 
Uh, they are two heads on top, and this is a, a description of their bodies. This has actually never been published in the scientific literature. This is a Life magazine article. They also appeared on Oprah Winfrey. Um, and this is Abigail, and this is Brittany. Um, they've got two hearts, but from the waist down, they're one. So um, as my daughter wanted to know who would be the mother if they had a baby, they only have one, they only have one set of reproductive organs, OK? Um, so it's, you know, who would be the mother? Well, you can't distinguish who's going to be the mother between the two of them. Here they are playing basketball as one. So they're, they're being considered one over here, riding a bike, tying a shoe. There's this, no one's quite sure how they can communicate with each other when they have separate heads. Everybody calls them, they're two, right? There's Abigail, there's Brittany, even though they can communicate well enough. Uh, I, and they were actually walking at an age younger than most children walk, which is pretty amazing. Now, for the archaeologists in the audience, I was happened just by coincidence to be walking through a museum in, um, in Turkey. Uh, the um, museum, it's called the, the uh, Anato uh, the, the, the Turkey's, the, the name of Turkey is Anatoly, the classical name of Turkey. And I was walking, and I had already known about Ab Abigail and Brittany, and all of a sudden I came up against this statuette. This is my picture in, in the museum. Look at the, uh, the asymmetry of these girls' heads, and look at the asymmetry here. And I was blown away. I sang, oh my God. And then I read what the archaeologist said. The archaeologist said, this is a goddess of mother, mother and child. So the interpretation, this is from um, 8,000 years ago. And I sus this is my interpretation. The archaeologists will correct me. They think it's wrong. Uh, my interpretation is that this was real. This was a, a real uh, human, what are called dicephalic twins over here. They were treated as a goddess, I suspect, because they were, they, they mean, you know, they're more than a human being, but it's not, this was not, didn't come out of, you know, out of the air. I think it was actually based on real human beings. Obviously, I can't know that, but it's just so striking how similar they look to, really, to Abigail and to Brittany. Um, these were some, some really sad pictures, okay, but I, but it's important to get my point across. These are all, the, these, these are two women who actually share 30% of their forebrain with each other. Um, they, they have, they have, each have one of their own eyes and they share, there's a third eye that they share. Um, this was not born alive, but it's an example. And all of these are examples of what happens when the embryo splits partially, but not completely. So when the embryo splits completely, you can get identical twins. If the embryo splits sort of, you know, the top part, but not the bottom, you get this. And sometimes you get things, uh, you get these things like this where the children's heads are, are joined together. In this particular case, what's happening here is that there were three brain areas. Uh, you can probably see that this child had a brain here, this one had a brain, and there was this area in the middle that the two children were sharing. And so when the physicians separated these babies, they had to decide who got this part of the brain. Um, and they decided to give this part of the brain to this child. Um, and after the operation, when these kids began to grow, they, they realized that part of the personality of this child was now inside of that child based on this, on this operation that was done. Very strange. Um, so, so now, this, these are two human beings, right? That's what we say in our society, Abigail and Brittany, okay? This is a, ch uh, a child that was born where there are two faces on one head. So is that one human being or two human beings? See, there's two heads here, at least. Here's one head with two faces. And all of these things happen I mean, so we have to deal with these things. This is a child who's a year old who has basically two brains inside of one head. And uh, you can see the split. She kind of, you can see the split over here in the mouth. She actually has two tongues. So this is a 12-month-old child with two, two cerebral cortexes, which are not connected to each other. Um, and this is a case that actually happened a month ago, but there have been other cases where this baby was born with a second head. And see, here's the mouth, and here's the nose, and here's the eyes. Uh, and the second head is actually bigger than the first head. And, the, and there's neurological activity in the second head. Nobody wants to talk about that. And that when they put their thumb into this mouth, the, be, the, the second head would suck on, on, on the thumb. So what's going on here? Are these two human beings, or are they one human being? You know, Where do we go? What, how do we distinguish between two and one? in all of these cases. I mean, most people would say this is one. 
even though it has two brains, and this is two because they're sort of, you know, they're looking at the heads and, this, and they're trying to figure things out. But if you go with the brain itself, then all of these are two. This would be two, two. They cut, unfortunately, this baby died when they, when they um, tried to detach the, the, the second head from the first head. But, you know, a lot of people don't even think that this would be possible, but it is. All these things happen and they don't get discussed very often. So what is deserving of respect as a human being? So now I'm gonna show you some more awful pictures. This is what an embryo can become. You have a one cell embryo, a 64 cell embryo, and in some cases, um, you can go into all these different things, okay? Uh, this is a teratoma, which has a reflex of action. It's actually grabbing the probe. Uh, this is just a mixture of tissues, and it doesn't look very much like a human being. Most of us would say it's not, but it has this reflexive this is hand over here and its arm. Um, I don't know what this is, but it came out of a human embryo. Uh, this also came out of a human embryo. This is, this is dead. Uh, and this is an example of a parasitic twin where this, this um, second body is growing out of this girl, and inside of her abdomen is the brain of the, of the, of the second body, um, which you can see through by an x-ray. Um, is deserving of respect. Would it be appropriate for doctors to cut this off to make this girl be more normal? Um, do you keep this alive or do you let it die? I mean, doctors let it die, basically. They don't keep this alive. And this is just a normal baby. And all these things can come out of, uh, out of an embryo. Uh, and so it's very interesting because if you think that any of these are not human beings, like this thing, for example, it's, there's a continuum between these embryos and this. And so somewhere along the way, if it was, began as a human being, it has to become a not human being at some point along the, along the developmental path. Um, so uh, the presence of a human mind and human parents doesn't work. This has human parents, just like you and I have human parents. There was a male and a female, sperm and egg came together to produce this. Um, and I think that uh, most people would say that is not uh, a human being. So the human parents doesn't matter. The human mind is also a very difficult thing too because as Peter Singer, my colleague, has pointed out, the mind present in a newborn baby um, uh, doesn't come anywhere near the mind of an adult chimpanzee. So it's difficult to use mind, and also there's some unfortunate children born every day who have minds that are far below the ability of typical human beings, and we still call them human beings, even if they don't have typical human minds. So that's very difficult. So um, the, uh, so I don't have the thing here, but what I'm gonna talk about now is the two that I've left on this, on this slide. One is the human soul, and the other is uh, human appearance. Um, when does a human being begin? Well, what people very often will do is they'll make an assumption. The assumption is a human being is either present or not. In other words, it, something is a human being or something is not a human being. And if you make that assumption and you take this baby, take my daughter here, this is not her, but this is just slides. If you take her, you can trace her back in a continuous path all the way back, actually all the way back to sperm and egg, which is what this is over here. Here's a one cell embryo. So development is continuous. That means that if you're, a human being is either present or not, this is clearly a human being. Uh, our, uh, most people would say this is a human being. Um, and you go back and biology is continuous. And so the argument is, well, since development is continuous, there couldn't be any point where, where, where all of a sudden there was a human being. The only discontinuity is here and at birth. And it's interesting because um, when I talked to the Catholic bishops and the Vatican has said, well, here's the discontinuity that counts. When, when uh, conception occurs, that's when the human being begins. Um, and uh, interesting, talking to an Orthodox rabbi, rabbi in, um, in uh, New York that I went to talk to, and he said, no, the Bible's very clear about this. The human being starts life with the first breath. Uh, God breathed, God breathed uh, life into a human being, and so there's also a discontinuity. And most biologists would say that's an irrelevant discontinuity, but nonetheless, it's a discontinuity between not breathing and, 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 uh, and breathing. So where does this assumption come from? Human being is either present or, or not. Um, the, well, I'm gonna tell you that I think this assumption comes from a belief in the soul. And um, there was one day that was an epiphany for me, it was about five years ago, when I gave a talk about this kinds of stuff to 
my colleagues in the molecular biology department and a professor whose name I will not mention said, no educated person believes in souls. He basically said, it's, it's not worthwhile talking about this stuff because this is just total nonsense. Uh, and that evening I was visiting my father-in-law who's a very educated person and my father-in-law said, no educated person denies the existence of souls. Now, these were both very educated people. So I was in a quandary, you know, are, are, are they, you know, which one's right? And I decided, um, well, first of all, it's not a topic of conversation among secular academics, which is true. You try to bring up this conversation among friends. I've tried this, at least my friends. Um, they don't want to talk about it. People don't want to talk about this very much. I think they're afraid of being embarrassed or embarrassing somebody else, I think. So I decided to do a um, survey of 400 Princeton undergraduates. Uh, it's an anonymous survey carried out by my research assistants. And uh, there were 200 sophomores and 200 freshmen. And then half of the sophomores and freshmen were, were men and women. So you could, you could break down the data by sophomore, uh, sophomore freshmen, men, women, and men. So I'll tell you right away, there was no difference between freshmen and sophomore. OK, but there was a big difference between men and women. Uh, and that's not just in my survey, but in lots of surveys. So this was the question. I had a whole series of questions. But one question was, do human beings have souls? OK, that was the question. This is Princeton University undergraduates which I consider to be an educated or educating population. Um, and this was the answer that they gave. Uh, it's, let's look at the total first. Yes, 66% said yes, they have souls. Um, no is 6% and don't know is 27%. A lot of people don't know, okay? Uh, the difference is always like this between men and women. Women are always, whenever you ask any kind of spiritual question, more women than men, um, uh, are going to be spiritual in, in some ways. So what is the meaning of a human soul, right? So here, this is the thing we're talking about, but what does a human soul mean? Um, well, most people in the world, I think, and I, this was shocking to me, believe that the soul is a vaporous-like spirit. It's the only way I can describe it. Uh, and this is something that I discovered going, traveling across Southeast Asia and India and, and across the Middle East. And essentially, this is, this is a woman who is, um, in our culture, we would say she's been dead for six months. And um, you see all this money they're putting around, around her to, to, uh, to help her in the afterlife. And what they did with her body right after this uh, is they burn it. And it's being cremated, and the smoke is going up into the sky. And there was one point, we were at this ceremony, this is in Bali, and there's one point at which there was a gust of wind that came, and the smoke kind of went through. There, there's a um, a white gossamer-like sheet. And so the soul went through the sheet, according to my uh, guide and other people there. It went through the sheet, and it went up. And every, everybody was very happy the soul had left the body. So the soul to them is not something exotic. It's, it's part of the physical world. And, and uh, where does the soul go? I asked them. Uh, and uh, they all said, to heaven, or whatever the Balinese word is for heaven. Um, where is heaven? Heaven's in the sky. And how long does it take to get there? Now this, they got a little, they had to, um, see, I mean, you know, to Americans or to Western people, th this is a silly question if you believe in the soul, um, but, but they had to figure out how long it took to get to, to the sky. And so and not a single one of them answered instantly. They had to think about it for a few minutes. And the answers I got ranged from five minutes to three days. Okay, so it took some time for the soul to, you know, they had to try to figure out how far away the heaven was. Um, and which led me to the realization that the main view of the universe that is held, I suspect, by the majority of people in the world looks like this. Um, it is, most people understand the world as the people I talk to. This is villages across Asia and Africa. Uh, they understand the world's uh, a sphere, um, but they think heaven, is, the, the end of the universe is at the blue sky, uh, sun, moon, stars all lie within the heavenly canopy which rotates around, around the earth. Also throughout these cultures, I also found a belief in the underworld, sort of, you know, where spirits go if you're not, if you're not virtuous during, during life. And that was shocking to me. I mean, you know, because I just thought, assumed people would know the, that the planets went around the sun and the galaxies and the universe. And most people don't know that, which, uh, now maybe you're not shocked, but I was shocked. Um, without a doubt, this is the whole universe, and this is where I found this also in Belize and, and actually South America and Africa as well. They don't have any need for the, uh, so the sort of the guard. Descartes suggested that the soul was part of a spiritual dimension that was spaceless, had no dimension, and it, um, 
uh, had no weight. Uh, they don't need that kind of complexity because they don't know enough science to know they need that kind of complexity to explain their spiritual beliefs. Uh, scientific knowledge is the cause of doubt and confusion. The people I talked to had no doubt. They, it, it was clear to them what was going on with the soul. Only my undergraduates were totally confused uh, because they knew some science. Um, so that's one way of talking about the soul. A vaporous like spirit, I don't know if you've seen this movie called 21 Grams. Uh, I thought this was an urban legend. It turns out that uh, this is the notion that when you die, you lose 21 grams. Uh, and that's the soul exiting your body. This is actually an experiment. This is real. Experiment done. Um, this is March 10th, I think it's like 1907. Um, uh, this physician in Massachusetts uh, weighed, put this bodies on a big scale, and uh, he, he weighed the bodies at the moment. They're all dying of tuberculosis back then. And um, he weighed them. And he had six subjects. And on average, they lost 21 grams at the moment of, uh, at the moment of death. And so that's the, that is the weight that he gave to the soul. And so, so it's not just the Balinese who think the soul is a kind of material substance. I mean, this is you know, the New York Times. This is the paper of record where you think that. Now, my students at Princeton don't think this. Uh, they think one of, one of these two, a non-material spirit without dimension or weight, which continues to exist after death. 28% of Princeton men think this, 40% of Princeton women think this. So this is, um, this is what Descartes suggested. Um, and uh, another group of students that are emergent property of the brain, so they think of the soul as, be if they believe in the soul, I mean, you can see the part that doesn't believe in the soul from, by adding these two together. Um, if they believe in the soul, they say, well, the soul emerges out of the physical matter of the brain. 34% uh, of Princeton men thought that, 25% of Princeton women. So the women, again, tend to be more spiritual um, than, than the men. So what is a soul? Now, I don't have time to give you all of the background, but people have been thinking about this for a long time, including Aristotle, who wrote a treatise called On the Soul. And um, in the classic Greek era, um, the soul was not the same as it doesn't, didn't mean the same thing as it means today. It basically meant the essence of life. I mean, to say that the soul didn't exist was the same thing to say that, uh, you know, this, this, this table doesn't exist. I and mean, clearly there was, there were living things and there were non-living things. And whatever the essence of life was, that's what people, that's what the Greeks thought the soul was. And Aristotle understood that there was, a, he, he separated the soul into three parts. He said a vegetative or nutritive soul, an animal or a sensitive soul, and a, and a rational soul. So he understood, he didn't know about cells. He didn't have a microscope. If he did, he'd, you know, he would have published all these papers in science and nature. Um, but he understood, I mean, he understood basically that there is life at a vegetative level. Plants are alive, um, and I'm sure he saw things like fungi and, you know, moss and things like that. Th those are a vegetative or nutritive soul, which is, we now know, consuming energy to reduce entropy. I'm not going to explain that, but anybody who's a chemist or taking chemistry knows what that is. An animal or sensitive soul, we now associate with a functional nervous system, basically. The rational soul is the last thing because, you know, people back then thought that humans were as different from animals as animals were from plants. So that's the rational soul, logic and, and computation. So I'm going to talk very briefly about animal souls, okay? And then I'm going to jump into humans. Um, do human beings have souls? So this I showed you already. Same, same uh, survey, can animals have spiritual souls? Um, so here, see it's less. 33% think animals have spiritual cell, so, souls. Uh, again, women more than men. Uh, huge number don't know, okay? They haven't thought of, you know, this is a concept you think people would have thought about, but no, they haven't thought it through. And um, so I just want you to look at this. This is a, a uh, dog robot that Sony has invented called IBO, A-I-B-O. And it is a, um, um, IBO means companion in Japanese. And this thing can run around the room. It can see, it has, uh, it has these cameras, and it also has this infrared light. So it can run around, it can play with a ball, and it can become sensitized to its owner, and it will try to please its owner. It's actually programmed with instincts to please its owner. Okay, and here you can see when it runs out of energy, this is what this is showing. It looks around the room for a charger and then it sits down on, on, on the charger. This is real. This is already being so, it's expensive. Otherwise, I would have, I would have bought it as a, as a prop. Um, but this is Sony selling this, and a lot of Japanese people are buying this because they, 
they don't want the mess of a dog, but they want the, you know, they want the dog. So this is the question. If you look over here, um, here see how it's sort of leaning on its, uh, on its, its limbs? This is from the Sony website. Uh, immediately interact with a matured ER or reset adult puppy stage. Six weeks to raise from puppy to adult. Understands 100 words. Recognizes your face and voice. And what happens is it's programmed so that if you say good dog, that, that reinforces the uh, behavior. It's also programmed to be um, novelty seeking. So it runs around and tries to do things. It's a bad dog that uh, uh, restrict, turns his behavior down. So that's what they mean by um, uh, going from puppy to adult, how its behavior will change in response to what, to what you're doing. So, this, so here we have this thing over here. And here we have a sea urchin, um, which, which is an animal. And here we have a schematic diagram, which is, so the first question, of course, for this audience, if you're not a biologist, which, this schematic diagram, does this go with this or this? <laughs> this is real. And the answer is, this is a small part of the schematic diagram of information flow in the sea urchin, not in the, not in the, in the dog. So which one of these is more animal-like? You know, if animals have souls, does the sea urchin have more of a soul than, than this? And, um, scientists are going to figure out, th these are all real genes and how they interact with each other. And at some point in the near future, we're going to have the whole network of uh, interactions that occur during, uh, during sea urchin development. Uh, we don't know how this thing's going to behave because it changes. And they all behave differently from each other depending on how, how you interact with it. I would say there are two very different worldviews as to whether or not um, you look at things like this in a mechanical kind of way, information flow kind of way, um, or you think of things in a spiritual way. So um, that's just a little bit of, you know, how difficult it is to define an animal soul. I mean, Aristotle uh, may be confused, or uh, he's smart enough to be able to figure this out. Um, so, the, so, oh, so let me just talk about this for a second. This is an interesting question I asked. Does an ecosystem or the biosphere have a unified soul? So I asked them about, I'm not going to show you the plant results, but I asked them about humans, animals, plants, and now I'm talking about an ecosystem. Does it have a unified soul? Um, the answer is men, 16%. Actually, this is a case where men and women were very similar. They said yes. This was the no. Again, you know, about a quarter don't know uh, one way. They, they're confused. They don't know whether a biosphere or ecosystem can have a soul. Uh, this is what Prince Charles said. I'm going to talk about this very briefly because it impacts, I think, the way people, especially Europeans, so um, think about genetic modification of, of, of plants. And Charles said, that he actually wrote this in, in, a, in a letter he wrote to the newspaper. I happen to believe that this kind of genetic modification, he's talking about genetic modification of plants, um, takes mankind to realms that belong to God and to God alone, apart from certainly highly beneficial specific medical applications. Do we have the right to experiment with and commercialize the building blocks of life? We live in an age of rights. It seems to me that it's time our creator has some rights too. So, he was arguing from a spiritual point of view that we should not be uh, manipulating plants. Europeans care more about plants than they care about embryos. And that's not a joke. That's actually, that's actually true. Um, and uh, there's a, there's a uh, rabble rouser in this country named Jeremy Rifkin who has a series of uh, advertisements that he put into the New York Times, which plays upon this, we shouldn't be modifying plants. We shouldn't be modifying animals because that's playing God and it's wrong for human beings to play God. Um, this is an example of uh, genetically engineered fish that went on sale about a month ago. They're, um, uh, they're uh, fluorescent, and uh, so they're, they're called glowfish. And uh, the question is, and see now, these fish, it's illegal to bring these fish into California. And uh, this is also illegal in the Netherlands and in Switzerland right now. Uh, the fish, as far as we can tell, are not suffering from having this glow. These are zebra fish. So these are already domesticated fish that are in fish tanks, OK? If the fish don't suffer, and they are not harmful to anybody, including the environment, and it's clear these fish, if you, if you let them out in the wild, they're all going to die. They're not going to affect the environment. Does this violate the integrity of the animal? So there's a notion in Europe that animals and plants have integrity, and that it's, it's, it's not just a question of suffering. My, my colleague Peter Singer says it's a question of whether the animal suffer. It's wrong to make an animal suffer. And I accept that. This is a violating what the animal should be. Okay, so it's important. Uh, this is just an example of how we violated animals. We turned the wolf into, into this totally unnatural thing over here. 
And um, this, is, this is a weed that uh, the uh, indigenous Central American people turned into, into maize. Corn did not exist until we created it by violating the integrity of the, uh, of the natural world. Uh, people think that, you know, this is in, um, this is in uh, Sumatra. Here's my family over here, and we're planting rice in the, in the, in the rice paddy. And uh, many people claim, well, we shouldn't be genetically engineering the rice or the, or, the, or the corn or anything else because this rice has been around for thousands of years. In fact, this rice is uh, a genetic, all the rice growing across Southeast Asia was created uh, by a rice institute in the Philippines over the last 25 years. So there's nothing historic or ancient about this rice. So this is the Judeo-Christian soul. It is uh, the, uh, the typical Judeo-Christian position is to ignore the vegetative and the animal and just focus on the human being, okay? Which I think greatly affects the, the attitudes in, in America where Americans don't care too much about genetically modified food. As long as it's safe, as long as it doesn't hurt the environment and it doesn't hurt us, well then, you know, that's fine to genetically modified food. This is kind of the, the attitude Americans have. And the Europeans are very upset about this, whereas in, a, in America, this is what counts as the soul. This is what the, 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 uh, the biblical soul is. It's a human being that has a soul. Why must something be either a human being or not a human being? So I'm gonna question the assumption because the, the whole idea here is that uh, something is either human being or it's not a human being. Science suggests Otherwise, science suggests that there are intermediates. If you look at the evolution from an ancestor that looked like this over five million years into her, this is a slow process. And we, we sorry? Progress. Progress, yes. <laughs> um, a scientist would say, well, you don't, there is no boundary. It's a continuous process, and it's somewhere along the way. It isn't that, you know, no human being, yes, human being. It is, you got to talk in terms of kind, you know, partial human beings, kind of in the middle here. And you could say the same thing about development. Uh, the Pope John Paul II accepts that this has happened biologically, but he claims that there is, at some point, which we don't know, there was what he calls an ontological discontinuity, so the spirit was put in at some point during a continuous biological evolutionary process. It's interesting to me, um, maybe people here know more theology than I do, uh, it's interesting for me that uh, he can accept that there's some kind of ontological discontinuity here, but not here. Uh, and I think there's a logical fallacy in, in that kind of an argument. So I'm gonna go to embryonic stem cells. I realize I'm talking too long. As I said, it's the first time I've given this lecture. Embryonic stem cells are uh, scientists want to work with them because they hope to be able to replace tissues and organs and overcome human disease. It's very contentious in the United States. Um, depends on how you ask the question whether or not people support it. But it's basically, there's a polarized country. People say yes, people say no. Um, this is embryo cloning. Uh, the difference between embryo cloning for therapeutic purposes is that here you start with the sperm and an egg. You get an embryo, ES cells, and hopefully get these organs. Here you start with a somatic. You take a nucleus from an um, adult cell, stick it into an egg, get an embryo. Th these look the same because it is the same. One, once you get past this stage, it's exactly the same. Um, there are people who think there's an ethical difference. Or I don't see an ethical difference. No matter whether if you believe this has a soul or not, they both look the same. They are the same here. But they would both look the same to me. Um, very quickly, genetic engineering of animals and human stem cells. Um, the the, the, the um, regenerative, regenerative medicine is going along at such an incredible pace, it's blowing me away. And I was always an optimist about where biotechnology would go. Uh, there, uh, uh, scientists have already reached the point where they're, they've grown human kidneys inside of mice. And so the idea would be to avoid problems is what you would do is you, you try to basically use stem cells and genetic engineering technology to be able to get pigs to grow human kidneys and human livers and human hearts. Um, and um, most people don't have a problem with this, okay? They say, okay, you know, except for animal rights activists who don't think we should be using animals. But if you don't, if you're not an animal rights activist, you say pig, pig growing human kidney, it's fine. Right, I mean, that's, that's what most people would say. And yet, um, when I suggest to students, what about a pig growing human arms? They get very upset. Now, I think this is, I, I don't, I think this is significant. I really do, because I think here, you know, kidneys inside, it's hidden, it doesn't look human. This 
is beginning to look human, and it's affecting, I think, our intuitive sense of what a human being is. It's appearance that really matters. So I'm going to go to the last part of my talk, which is um, talking about reprogenetics, which is using genetic technology to affect the outcome of um, human beings. And this is a survey done by Harper's Magazine. It's not me. If you had to choose one of the following, who should have the power to control the genetically linked characteristics of a child before birth? And they were given four choices, four possible answers. Uh, the parents, this is Americans, American adults. 11% said the parents should have the, um, uh, have the power to control what genes go to the child. Uh, the doctors, 0.7%. You know, we don't, we don't want doctors deciding for us. We have to decide ourselves. Um, no one is 16% and God is 70%. So this is the way Americans answered this particular question. So most people thought that God should have the power to control the genetic inheritance of a child. Um, what's the foundation for this majority viewpoint? And so I'm going to give you my interpretation of what the foundation is. Um, people today understand what uh, reproduction is. People understand in, in, in Western society, they understand about sperm and eggs coming together. Um, they kind of understand, you know, here's a chimp, here's a human. They understand kind of, they probably don't know that the embryos look um, identical, but they kind of understand the genes are important, right? The genes have a lot to do with how both of these come out. Um, and I showed you this already, the genetic correlate of the human soul are these, you know, genetic differences. And if you, if you ask people about evolution, you'll see how evolution comes in this in a second. Three million years ago, um, there was Lucy. There's this famous uh, uh, pre-human fossil that was obtained. And if you look over the last three million years, there's this explosion in the size of the, of the, um, of the skull, brain size, which, which people are correlating with, uh, with intelligence as you look over the last three million years. So, what caused this explosion in brain size, okay? Who or what res is responsible for this? And there's basically three views in the United States. Uh, one, 5% of Americans say natural selection of random events, that it was uh, Darwinian evolution, and that's how this, how this came about, 5% uh, of Americans. 45% uh, 40, say, yes, evolution occurred, but God guided the gene changes, okay? So this is... This is kind of like what uh, Pope John Paul II says. Uh, and 50% say God made each species genes separately. So in other words, we started at the top. There was no, there was no evolution. This is what 50% of, and th this is not an a, a, um, obscure result. This is the kind of thing that the surveyors get over and over and over again. Now, the interpretation of this, this is the influence of science on religion, is that 95% of Americans believe we owe our genes to God. In other words, either because God created us with these genes or because um, God, God guided the changes. So here we come over here and we say, you know, if God was the one who gave genes to us, we really should let God give genes to our children. So in the survey, same survey, next question. Eventually, genetic technology may allow a couple to control certain characteristics of their unborn child. If you were expecting a child, would you like to control genes affecting the following four characteristics? Same survey, same, same group of 1,000 people. And then they, they put four characteristics and said, would you like to control, if you were expecting a child, would you want to control these characteristics in your child? First characteristic was disease immunity, 84% said yes. Now, this looks like a contradiction, right? They're saying, yeah, uh, you know, God should be controlling the genes. But now when you give them a specific example of controlling genes, they say yes, huge numbers say yes. Uh, intelligence, 64% say yes. Um, sexual orientation, 51%, and uh, gender, 19%. So people don't, I mean, people don't care that much about sex. They care a lot about health and, and intelligence. This looks like a contradiction. Uh, I don't, and, and you might say, you know, same people, it is a contradiction. I don't think it is, because I think what's happening is the gut reaction is God. And it's only when you start giving people concrete examples where they say, you know, if I can give my kids genes that protect against cancer, would you want to do that? And you start thinking rationally. This is sort of an emotional answer, and these are more rationally oriented answers. And I think that's what's happening in most of our minds. Um, so what about the future? Um, if we look at my son and this beautiful chimpanzee, uh, the two differences that are significant, I know there are other differences in immune systems and things like that. The two significant differences are the appearance, 
and the mind. And uh, those are really what I would call the human essence differences. Um, what's the future going to be like in terms of our descendants in five million years? So here we have what we look like, what our ancestors looked like five million years ago, my daughter, and then, you know, five million years in the future. Are we going to change as much as this changed? I don't have time to give you the answer. I think the answer here is no. And if somebody wants to ask me why, I will, uh, and basically because there are such cultural differences in what is, what is a nice, what is beautiful, and what is not beautiful. And um, there are six billion people on Earth, and I think that that if um, human civilization survives, I don't think, I think it's unlikely that this is going to change. We don't really care about that. Um, this people do care about, mental ability. Okay, this is what's happened over the last three million years. Will there be an increase in mental ability? Well, if we ab abide by human rights, this won't happen by natural selection because the Darwinian view of natural selection is the only genes that evolve are genes that allow an individual to have more children. But in a society, if, if human rights, if the entire world becomes industrialized and people abide by human rights, then individuals never reach their, don't reach their um, uh, capacity for reproduction. And it doesn't really matter where, where they are on the spectrum, the eco socioeconomic spectrum, that doesn't determine how many babies they have. You be the smartest person in the world, you don't have more babies, then you're not Darwinianly more fit than, than, than somebody else. So it's not going to happen through natural selection, I don't think. But genetic engineering is extremely powerful. And this is a, this is a, a, um, a paper that was published in Nature magazine. And this is a normal mouse brain. And the important thing to notice is that the normal mouse brain, the cerebral cortex is uh, here, it is smooth. And by changing a single gene, uh, these scientists were able to get a mouse brain that looked like this. And you see how the, you have the, all these folds in the cerebral cortex? This cerebral, and this is what happens to human brains during fetal development, is the cerebral cortex grows so much that we can't fit. And so it, it folds in. Actually, they didn't realize that that they thought, people thought there was a separate gene for the folding. There isn't. It's just a question of filling space. That's one gene. Scientists, I mean, anybody who's a neuroscientist in this room knows how much we are learning very, very continually uh, with this. So my conclusions of all of this is that varied notions of soul will play a powerful role in societal acceptance of both human affecting uses of biotechnology and plant animal biotechnology, which I didn't talk about very much. It's not going to be decided purely by a rational argument because we are emotional beings. Uh, no matter what we do or don't do, we will affect the future of human life as well as the future of biosphere. I didn't, I didn't talk about the biosphere stuff, but every choice to do something or not do something will cause a different uh, outcome to occur. I mean, every choice. Not doing something is the same thing as doing something in terms of having an effect on on the outcome of the world. Politics, religion, and science are all going to interact in complex ways. If you look at these three things, science is the most easy, I would say, to predict. Politics is impossible to predict. Um, and religious beliefs are very powerful and exist, I would say, naturally uh, in most people around the world. Notions of soul, even if people don't quite know what the soul is, they have notions of soul, which are, which are very, very much, I think, a part of of, uh, of a normal human experience. I think scientists are the weird ones, not uh, other people in the world. And thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you. Thank you very much, Lee, for an extraordinary talk. We do have time for questions, so let me repeat again. Uh, if you have a question, please ask it uh, clearly and loudly enough so that we can all hear. <laughs> I have microphones here so it can be, pick, get picked up on the tape. So who would like to go first? <laughs> Hannah. Is it on yes. now? Okay. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about why you were coming to speak to us about the soul. What is, what is it about your 
responsibility or your sense of calling or um, your your place in your career that that has made you uh, move from molecular biology into talking to a wider public about about the soul what's the what's the context of of that for you um I think the debate over biotechnology is too polarized, um, not just in this country, but in every other country as well. I think biotechnology is a very powerful technology, which can be used for good purposes and bad purposes. And I think there have to be voices that um, help people understand what this technology is and try to bring out what their objections might be so that they can consider the objections themselves with the scientific viewpoint as well and come to a more informed decision. So that's one reason. I, I really think that most scientists, uh, unfortunately, um, don't want to, quote, waste their time talking to the public. They just want to say, you know, just leave me alone. Just let me stay in the laboratory. Let me do my work. This is really good for human beings. And it's a very arrogant point of view. Uh, most scientists um, don't have a connection to the rest of the world. And I was one of those scientists 10 years ago. And I realized how, how naive I was about the way people thought only after, I mean, the epiphany with my father-in-law and my molecular biology colleague, getting out into the world, talking to people, and uh, realizing that you can teach people as well, that you can talk to people and then you can, you can get rid of misconceptions. So, so my role, I, I don't have any answers. My role is really to try to explain to people demystify concepts, help them to use their own minds to decide what is good or bad, and I think that is gonna be the best for society. That's a long-winded answer, but that's kind of, that's where I'm coming from. Other questions? Bob. You may, no, I, is it on? Okay. Uh, maybe you can explain something that mystified me at the time. I was on sabbatical in New Zealand watching the news, and they, there was a conversation with a anti-unnatural uh, uh, organism person with a news thing, and the, the, this person said that it, the, the, said it's immoral. Gene splicing is immoral. Yes. And the, the, you know, it always frustrates you on the news because the interrogator then changes the subject instead of asking the follow-up question. And I was desperately curious to think of why he thought it was immoral. I could think, you know, I could understand a statement that's against my religion, uh, but immoral is, is uh, it was something that never quite computed to me. My, my opinion is that uh, people hold certain spiritual beliefs without really knowing that they're spiritual beliefs necessarily. It, it, I don't even think it has to be a specific religion. I mean, the, Europe has tended to be very, has greatly reduced the number of people who, who go to church and who believe in traditional religion. And you, but Europeans are very spiritual even though they won't say it. Um, you, you don't want to say this. <laughs> it looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> it's an emotional response. I don't think people know that it has this uh, spiritual uh, foundation. And when I tell people that corn didn't exist until it was bred by the indigenous people in Central America, they're shocked. I mean, people think that, you know, cows, they were always there. You know, these, these creatures that create 12 gallons of milk. I mean, you've got lots of them around here, right? And corn, it was, it was always there. And people don't understand that, you know, if you're talking about violating the integrity of a system, we've done it already. And which is not necessarily good. We, the, the, I think it's 30% of the total land on Earth is, is now being used by human beings for agriculture. And so we've destroyed ecosystems all over the world. And so there's this conflict, you know, that we want to support six billion people on Earth. Is it, is it better to grow, you know, destroy the ecosystem, burn down the forest, grow all this food, which allows people not to starve? Or do we want to go back and some people want this? They say, well, you know, we should get rid of human beings and allow all this to go back to nature. This is all very spiritual. 
I, I really believe it's very spiritual, and it's this, you know, the immorality is, like Prince Charles said, you know, God created the organisms in this way. That's in terms of religion. It doesn't have to be religion, because I've talked to people across Western Europe who claim to be atheist, who still believe in the, what they call the integrity of life, the integrity of animals and the integrity of plants. Now, you have another explanation for where that comes from, except from a, a deep-seated, maybe unconscious, spiritual conceptualization. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> question up here. Yes, uh, you started uh, uh, by considering uh, the difference, genetic difference between uh, human and chimpanzee. But let's say the dif on that same linear scale, the difference between a human and an amoeba is only 20% or right. something like that. Yes. So uh, the, the, uh, you must consider it in a somewhat nonlinear fashion. I guess it, it must be, uh, as far as the at least appearance of the organism, tremendous differences in that 1%. Uh, so uh, do you think there are some uh, genes that are uniquely human, something that predisposes us to have a soul or believe in higher being that other species don't have? Yes. So the, the, the reason I show the 99% similarity is because um, I know that when I went to graduate school, we didn't have DNA sequencing. And people, well, this is before um, there was a group at UC Berkeley that showed how close chimps were with humans. People just assumed that we were completely different. You know, that between us and, it turns out, as, as you said, there are some genes that yeast have which have not changed in function. Yeast are, you know, what we grow to make bread and, uh, and wine. Um, and they, there's this gene called RAS. They can knock it out in yeast, which kills the yeast. And then they can put the, the human gene in, and the yeast are fine. So the human gene and the yeast gene function the, sa the, the same way. And, the, and I mean, to me, that was shocking, because I also had these deep-seated emotional beliefs that turned out not to be true. I mean, I, I think that's very important. So, so the difference between humans and chimps is a bunch of little bases. Some of them are clearly going to be uh, d uh, critical to determining the ability to create a human brain and a human mind. Now, this is the question, which I don't have an answer to. Is any one of those changes essential? I hope people need to bet the answer is no. Now, what my, my uh, colleagues who believe what Pope John Paul said uh, you know, there was this discontinuity between the chimp-like brain and the human brain. They think that there is a, uh, a base change. That is it. If that's true, if you change one base at a time, you should be able to find that, and boom, you go from human back, back to chimp. My gut reaction is that that's not going to happen, that there is no single base that defines human beings, that, you know, there are a whole bunch of little changes that have occurred and that, you know, somehow brings about the complexity that is our brains that can produce our minds. That's my viewpoint. We have time for another question or two? Would it make any difference if the concept of the soul is logically equivalent to the concept of square circles? Um, <laughs> so you're basically saying it's completely illogical. Um, it, would that make a difference? No. Um, my sense is that we as human beings have an instinctive ability to recognize other human beings. And one thing I didn't say in my talk, which has really been very, you know, I'm trying to figure out for myself, how do you define a human being? Um, I don't know the answer, but one thing that has really struck me is something that I thought was very, very trivial, which is very important, which is appearance. And so you say, well, you know, appearance is only skin deep, but I think that reaches into deeply into us, and we see something that looks like a human being, and we call it a human being. Um, now, right, see, none of these were issues 30 years ago because you couldn't separate these things, but now biotechnology allows you to, to, to separate things. I mean, you know, back in the, I, I think people, the, the people that I've talked to who know no science are much happier. Um, they're content. No, I'm serious. They are, you know, they, I, they may be better off than, you know, because science is subversive and it's upsetting 
and it's confusing in terms of you know trying to confront scientific facts with what your uh, instinctive worldview might be. Um, so you know, people, as I you know, as you, as you just saw, the soul. I, I spoke in front of the uh, Council of Catholic Bishops in Washington D.C., and these are all very smart men. Um, and I asked them to tell me what the soul was, assuming that there would be a single Catholic position on the soul. And there wasn't. So it's not something that they had discussed with themselves. Some of them thought the soul was a spirit that left the body at death, and others thought that didn't happen, that the soul was you know, something intrinsic in the human being, and when you died, there was nothing. And so there's a line in the Bible that says, you know, when you... Uh, de well, you know, the dead people don't hear or feel anything. And then they thought on, on the day of resurrection, it all came back. But between now and then, there was nothing. And, and what's amazing to me is here are these extremely well-educated Catholic theologians who are leading the Catholic Church in the United States, and they have such completely different views of this, of this topic. I mean, they all think the soul's important, but they, you know, what's the soul? Some, th those are totally different views in my mind of what the soul is. Susan. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, I was interested to hear you say that you uh, thought that 5,000 years from now people won't look appreciably different uh, because we're a very large breeding population, essentially panmictic, six, 6 billion. It's very different from what you postulated in Remaking Eden, with the, which took a very uh, particular tendency of human beings to allocate resources um, uh, to themselves, and in this case these would be ability for genetic enhancements where you had the gen riches and the naturals and that several hundred, only hundreds of years down the line, you really were positing some scenarios where speciation was taking place. 10% of the population had all the enhancements and the naturals, the teeming masses. Um, have you changed your mind about that and how, you know, human proclivities uh, and social systems, etc., cultural systems interact with these technologies to make these sorts of things possible? Or how has your thinking changed? Um, I, I was naive when I wrote Remaking Eden. <laughs> I didn't think you were. Um, no, I'm serious. Um, when I look at, a, when I think of human beings, as I said, the essential features I now believe are the way we look and the way we think, which is what distinguishes us from all the other animals and from, from everything else. The way we look, I mean, as anybody who's an, an anthropologist in this room knows, you know, you know, who's beautiful and who's ugly, and you know, it's, it's, there's, it's all over the place. And it doesn't matter if you're, even if a society considers you to be ugly, you know, as Frank Sinatra said, everybody finds somebody and marries and has babies. And as far as Darwin's concerned, that's all that counts. And that's, that is, the, I mean, the caveat is that um, my economist friends are right, and industrialization takes over the world, and we all know what industrialization does. Industrialization lowers the um, birth rate. Right, so high, you know, when you become highly industrialized, I don't know why, you guys can tell me. Women become smart and they have less babies. And um, they, so if that happens, then natural selection sort of gets eliminated there. So um, let's go to genetic engineering, okay, which is different, I would argue, because you know, in the old days, the idea of eugenics was horrible because you were selecting one person over another person, okay. I think the and the and the, it wasn't you who was doing selecting; it was the you know some big government that was selecting. We're not talking about selecting people here. We're talking about selecting genes. And so, if you reach the point where you've got an embryo, you're not you know you're not selecting. You're selecting whether that embryo has this gene or that gene. Whether that child is going to be talk about something like cancer resistance. We almost are at the point where. We know what we could do to make a child extremely resistant to cancer. It's already been done in mice, right? So think about something like that. That's something everybody's, you know, th this is not just a cultural thing. I mean, everybody would want their children to be resistant to cancer and stroke and heart disease and all these other things. Everybody would want these health, these health issues. So let's come back to the question of um, the gen rich and the naturals. And uh, it was the major objection that scientists had to my, to my scenario. Um, and I think they're right. And I think what's going to, I mean, what's going to happen is this technology, I think genetic engineering of human embryos is going to happen. Uh, this is not my talk. It's usually the talk that I give. 
I think it's going to happen because parents, normal parents, want to improve the lives of their children. And my trip through Southeast Asia uh, brought that home to me, that that is something that happens all over the world. That every, every person that I talked to said, I mean, didn't say it in these words, but wanted their children to live a better life than they lived everywhere. So um, I think that's completely, and you know, there's some weird parents. You know, we, we were talking about them at dinner. I don't want to get into that. But there, I think it's normal to want your children to be better off than you are. And genetic engineering is going to help that happen. Now, I don't, I think that there's so much communication gene flow around the world that I don't think there's going to be a separation. Um, I really think that, you know, yes, the, the rich countries are going to get it first. Um, my in vitro fertilization friends said it's not going to be that expensive. Uh, they're thinking about doing it for $20,000, which means that, you know, 80% of the population, you know, one shot of $20,000 to give your kid, you know, this cassette of genes that improves all these functions. You know, it doesn't have to be um, absolute because we all know that genes are probabilistic. But parents, believe it or not, spend $150,000 to send their children to Princeton University for four years. Why? What do they get out of that? All they get is, you know, an increased probability of success. Maybe. That's it. They don't get any absolutes. There's no guarantees. So a lot of kids come out of Princeton that, you know, completely, you know, don't use their education and are total losers. And we all know that. Uh, not the speakers that you've had in the past, but all you're getting, you're, you know, you're getting an increase in probability for $150,000. So I think that parents might say, you know, increase the probability of health benefits, you know, if it's safe, sure, and it'll go across American society, and then it'll go across the world. And somebody brought this home to me at one seminar, told me how quickly, in geological time, the, the HIV virus has spread around the world. You know, so in an, and that's a good indication of sex, you know. So basically he said, it's, it's, it's as if everybody in the world's having sex with everybody else in the world. It's a single population. Uh, if that holds, then I don't think there can be a divergence. So I'm retracting what I said at the end of uh, remaking Eden. It's almost 9.30. Let's take one more question, and then we can break for a reception outside and continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wonder if you have a essentialist concept of a soul, that there is a soul beyond social definition. Because on the one hand, of course, you say the soul is, depends on social definitions, like in your inquiry of students. But um, I got a notion that you have a concept of the soul behind that, which is essentialist, which is there beyond social definitions, unchangeable. Um, I don't know what to think. I mean, I know that. Um, I'm a biologist, and so what I see is the soul, uh, in the broadest sense, is how we, how it's, it's in my mind that you are a human being. And uh, one, of the, one of the things in my mind is a theory of mind that psychologists have shown that human beings recognize that other people have minds, um, which is, I, I, that, that comes as part of our machinery. Uh, and I think that another part of our machinery is we recognize other human beings as being human beings by their appearance. So it's kind of an operational definition of a soul. It's not like I have no idea why, but you are a human being in my mind. I disagree with my colleague Peter Singer. I think there is a difference between human beings and, and chimpanzees. I can't put my finger on it. Um, and neither can anybody else, you know, as far as, you know, anybody who has some science. As I said, science is very subversive, and, and it, it, science causes this conflict between rationality and emotionality, and people who can just depend upon emotionality probably are better off. Well, let me thank Ellen Butler for arranging the uh, refreshments that are outside. Let me thank all of you for coming, and Professor Silver, thank you very You're much. You're very for welcome. Thank you. Thank you.